The Digital Photography Cafe show is brought to you by Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool for your camera. Welcome to the Digital Photography Cafe show. Join host Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina as they serve up the hottest photography news and commentary. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. This is episode 163. I'm Joseph Christina here with my co-host Trevor Curran. On last week's show, we talked with loyal listener Fred Pfeiffer and reviewed the Sigma DP2 Quattro compact camera. If you haven't watched last week's show, I encourage you to do so. You can find it at digitalphotographycafe.com and our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. Listen with the popular Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox music apps, or subscribe through iTunes or RSS. So Joe, we are back. How you doing? Very well. How are you doing, my friend? Doing good. The craziness Excellent. continues here at the office, so we're, uh, you know, Absolutely. we missed last week yet again, but yes, we are yes. hoping to get back into a regular schedule starting in September. Um, yep, our, we are back. Yeah, our kids will all be yeah, back Yeah, we got the school, kids back. So. <laughs> That's the main thing, right, Trev? The kids are back to school, um, and then everything starts settling in. We know that September, that's when season starts and things start getting crazy, but that's when there's a lot more um, scheduling going on. So it right. works out a lot better, that's for sure. Yeah, it really does. I mean, we can crank open the calendar, see what's what for the, the day, and then plan accordingly. But when you, yeah. you know, when you have the variable of the kids home all the time, you just don't know what's going to happen. You know, you don't want to mm-hmm. say, no, we can't go in the pool right now because daddy has to work. So, you know, you want to take an hour, go jump in the pool and that kind of throws the rest of the day off. And, yeah. you know, plus we try yeah. getting like last minute trips in before they go back and stuff. So, you know, it's, yeah, it summer's a, always hard. Time. And then you're, yeah, and you're trying to um, balance all that with all of that client work that continues to come in. So, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, it really does. It I is mean, what it is. I'm, I have been greatly blessed this summer, I tell you. You know, yeah. summer for a lot of people is a downtime. Um, you right. know, they're really, they're struggling to find work. And I've been blessed this summer. I mean, the work has been coming in. Um, I just got the opportunity for um, another big web project that I got a client call with next week. So uh, this this is really good, yeah. And and I've been trying to work on a couple of my own projects and just haven't mm-hmm. been able to get to them, you know. You always yeah. set your own stuff on the back burner, you know. That's how it is. I know. It's hard to calendar stuff. I know I got uh, two new products that um, came out, so that was uh, an accomplishment for such the yep. the hard period of time. <laughs> yeah, summer. yeah, that's so, great. I'm very happy about that and uh, able to share with everyone some of these new products that hopefully help them as they help me. So, But uh, kind of moving into uh, today's show, and we're going to kind of grab um, backups uh, kind of by the bootstraps and see you know, what we can do with them and where where do we go with them and what do we do and what do we use and where do we put them and where do we not put them and um, what's good and what's not good. And a lot of people have a mis, you know, conception that the, the things that they store on their hard drive or even their backup drive is just safe. And right. the bottom line is it really is not. No, no. And it's definitely not safe forever. You know, I mean, it, even with good backup systems in your studio, even with battery backups and all this other stuff to help prevent, you know, surges and, and destruction that way, things happen, things go wrong. And it really, you know, pays to have a good system put in place that right. offsite backup, whether it be, you know, some form of uh, media that you take out of the studio or some form of cloud backup. I mean, there's all kinds of things like that that you have to really consider and put in place. Right, no, absolutely. And so the the idea, I guess, today was uh, backup alternatives, I guess, right. is one of the uh, points here that we're gonna kind of touch on. And that really, uh, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and I said it's, it's something that we really need to kind of get into because um, the solid the solid state backup is kind of where it is right now. Right. Uh, no moving parts is really what we want because every time you have the something moving, it's another thing for it to break. So yeah, um, another point conventional, of failure. Yep. Yeah. So conventional hard drives spinning at you know fifty four hundred RPMs or six or seventy two hundred RPMs or faster, um, that's just wear and tear, and they only spin for X number of hours. After that, 
they're dead. Yep. That's just it. They're dead and they're not recoverable unless you want to go spend thousands of dollars to send them out to have those plates uh, removed and with people with little bunny suits on, <laughs> on in a in a dust free uh, you know a clean room. We don't want that. So um, solid state is something to look into, and there's a lot of alternatives now. Well, originally, when SSD came out, it was just so expensive yeah. that you just you can't afford it. I mean, even like for example, um, we use MacBook the Airs, right? Yep. Well, my Air. The original Air, I think, came out with 64 gigs. Mine is 128, which is nothing compared yeah. to the normal desktops that have terabytes of data in them, right? Sure, yeah. I mean, my I just bought a MacBook Pro um, a few like a month or so ago, and I was able to get that with the 512 um, yeah. flash storage, which is, I mean, it's fantastic. It's super fast. I mean, it's 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 wonderful, but it's it's 512. I mean, traditional computers, you know, coming with traditional moving hard drives, I mean, you're able to get terabytes in them now. Right. So the main thing here is we really want to keep the actual computers clean and do everything external. So using right. USB 3 or using Thunderbolt or Firewire or some other way to actually use external storage for the meat and potatoes and just use that 512 or for me, the 128 for just um, applications and that's it. Yeah, and your operating um, system. Yep. In your operating system. Exactly. So, um, you know, moving into it now, we know that um, these hard drives is definitely a point of failure is just spinning parts. But one of the other things is the technology behind them. Now, originally, I don't know if, if people are a little bit older in the computer field, they know the original XTs and they had AT, you know, AT buses. The, it went from um, SAT, you know, the SATA drives and SATA 2 and SATA 3. Um, and originally it was ATA bus. And then now they have eSATA and, and whatnot. Um, the thing is, is as these architectures change or as they become obsolete, obsolete. Um, you end up with problems. And a perfect example is if you have an ATA drive, an old drive, today you really can't even get an ATA card. I mean, Microsoft discontinued ATA, um, I think it was in 2007. So it's not even the supported um, bus, you know, supported um, uh, means of reading anything at this point. It's They still use it here and there, but not for the hard drives. Yeah. So that's a problem. Yeah, and SCSI too. I mean, SCSI was the interface of choice for all Mac computers back from the, you know, the, the 90s on up. Um, you know, that, I mean, you had your SCSI hard drives, all your external peripherals were SCSI powered, you know, and that bus... Right doesn't even come in any computer anymore. I mean, SCSI is still a viable option in data centers and things like that. But exactly. as far as the consumer level, as far as what computers we're buying, um, you're not getting that SCSI interface anymore. They're not making SCSI interface hard drives. It's all yeah. USB. It's all Thunderbolt. It's all network. You know, yeah, I mean, it's, so that's out. So if you've, you know, if you had built your backup solution, your storage solution around this older architecture, this is a concern and this is something that, you know, you would really have to think about future proofing and how you're going to migrate that. Yeah. Yeah. And that and that's 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 an important point is the migration. Um, we know that. We should be using, for example, a RAID type of setup if we want to keep our data safe. That's just that's just the way it is. If you yeah. guys know what RAID is or you don't know, RAID basically comes at different levels. You got RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, and so on and so forth. RAID 0 is basically striping. That's making two, two drives work simultaneously together and splitting the data across the two drives, which basically makes them faster, which yeah. doesn't give you any backup no no sent no redundancy at all then you have raid one which is a mirror and that basically is a copy of drive one and drive two so you have identical things being written to the two drives simultaneously which is great and then you have raid five which is kind of a combination and it has parity meaning that you can take an entire drive out of the raid array and it will go ahead and you can stick a new one in and it'll go ahead and rebuild itself right so raid five is usually the best way to go but raid five requires that you have three five drives or so um more, more drives to have that parity drive that's um, that's keeping everything, let's say, in, in sync. sync. Right, right. Yeah, so, I use RAID 0 in my Mac Pro. I have three um, 500 gig hard drives that are all striped together. And right. uh, the throughput 
Um, it's amazing, was incredibly right? fast. And I did that specifically for recording video, editing video, recording audio. I wanted right. to make sure I had a really fast drive set up that there would be no latency, no delay, no dropped um, blocks or anything. So that's why I use that. Um, right. But for me, as you know, I mean, I'm a big Drobo fan, so I'm kind of using the Drobo RAID um, mm -hmm. version. Uh, right. you know, so I've got the redundancy. I don't have the speed, um, but th that's not what it's for. It's for the redundancy, the protection of the data. Yeah, yeah. And bear in mind, um, these drives run, they can, they can move data, let's say, at 150 to 200 to 300 uh, megabytes per second, which is fast enough for doing video. Oh, yeah. um, the, th the thing is now, these SSD drives are doing that and triple that. Yeah, so, they're smoking fast. Yeah, so you're actually able to get um, 4K video dumped raw right onto these SSD drives yeah. um, live, you know, real time, and then go and split them up. And now you have two SSDs split yeah. up, and you can have some insane, it's, insane It's sick um, where the speeds. technology has gone, yeah. I mean, back, you know, right. I mean, not too long ago, a couple years ago, I mean, you, you had spinning hard drive options. That was it. I mean, now, I mean, the, the new Mac Pros, I mean, the SSDs they come with are, are just nuts. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're yeah. doing 4K, like you said, right right on to the internal, you know, flash storage in this thing. I mean, yeah, it's just it's amazing. It's crazy. That's like you were saying with the data centers and the SCSI stuff. That's exactly what it is because, you know, we know that these drives run, our normal drives run at 5,400, 7,200 RPMs. Those, those SCSI drives are running at 15,000 RPMs. Right. You know, when they would spin up, you can hear them. It sound like a, a, a turbo, you know, spinning up. It's crazy. Right. But now well, we don't need all that. that's the thing with these hard drives too, using them as a backup solution. You know, if, right. if you stop, you know, using a hard drive, if you fill it, you remove it from your RAID or, or you have a standalone um, port that you just, you know, dump like a raw drive into or whatever. And you're using right. this as a backup solution and you go store it in your closet or something. You need to plug that in every so often and keep those moving parts moving. Otherwise, yeah. if you know, the, the drive will go bad and you will lose that data. Another yeah. big drawback to using, you know, spinning media for archive. Right. That's a good point. But not a lot of people understand that. And that is absolutely 100 percent the case. Um, you cannot just store a hard drive in a static free bag nope. indefinitely, indefinitely. Yeah. Um, after use and um, and expect the data will be there in two, three, four years, because honestly, it just might not turn back on. No. That's just that's just the nature of the beast. That's just how they work. Um, so be careful. A lot of people, you know, have done that. They've taken, you know, drives and they go and send it away or they'll go and put it into a safety deposit box and they think that they're safe. And the truth of the matter is they're not. So my suggestion would be take a look at we know SSDs are the way to go. The problem is, that, guys, they're still expensive, yeah. right? Um, there's alternatives to that. And what I like to do is I like to look at the little pen drives and some people say, oh, well, they're slow and they're, well, most of them are a little bit slow, but there are pen drives now. For example, SanDisk has one that's an Extreme Pro and that thing has a read write of over 245 megabytes per second. Right. That is the equivalent to a extremely high speed um, SSD drive. Yep. So here you are able to take a little pen drive the size of your finger, plug it into the side of your Mac or your PC and be able to read and write off it at the same speed as if you had an SSD in the computer. Yeah. So it's a it's a really good option. Yeah, yeah, I like that too. And in fact, I mean, it's it's a relatively inexpensive large capacity storage option for archiving, you know, backups, right. something that's small that you can throw in a bag and take with you when you leave the studio or store in a safe deposit box. But the other interesting thing, and you know, Joe, you brought this up, and honestly, I had never really thought about it, but you know, nowadays, like with the Macs, all the apps that we buy are on the App Store. And we can right. go in there and download them and run our updates and everything at any time. We get a new computer, we put in our Apple ID, we go to the App Store and it says, oh, you bought these apps, do you want to install them? They're available right. to, to reinstall when needed. So you could theoretically put apps, maybe not your primary creative suites um, necessarily, but other apps, things that you use, games, or, you know, whatever. You could mm -hmm. actually load these apps on your pen drive and just 
plug it into the computer when you want access to those apps, you know? And if you yeah. need to reload them because you lost the data on the pen drive, then you plug another pen drive in, you install it on there. Right, right. Yeah, it is, that is, it's really nice. Um, and you said about games. It's, just, it's absolutely the case. Um, Apple does it, of course, but let's say you're a Steam um, client yep. and you have a lot of games on Steam. Well, Steam goes and downloads those games, sometimes 10 gigabytes, um, 20 gigabytes onto your machine itself. Right. But it also stores that in the cloud saying, I own that, you own this. Yep. So you can very easily take all your entire Steam directory. It could be uh, 30 gigabytes, let's say, get a little 64 bit, uh, 64 um, uh, gig pen drive, which costs you uh, 40, 50 bucks, and put all of those games on there and completely free up 30, 40 gigs on your main machine. Right. So, yeah, that is a really good alternative. People ask that a lot. I have a MacBook Air or I have a specific um, computer that has an SSD drive and I don't have a lot of space. What do I do? This is a perfect way, like, like, like we're talking about to unload those applications, unload your entire music library yeah. onto one of these pen drives. It yeah. it's really really nice. Now for me, I actually have a um, a USB like a um, a little brick where I can plug in. I think it's like six or eight different USB drives, and it's powered. You don't want one that's not powered because you need that little yeah, extra, you need juice. That so, extra juice. Extra juice. Yep. And I can go and plug in up to eight different um, USBs at USB 3 speed yep. and access eight of these pen drives right from um, the Mac, which is crazy. And the yeah. speed, like I'm saying, is like as fast as an SSD drive within the computer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I would say music applications, uh, many of your applications. And I, guys, I have tested this and it does work. I've run Premiere, um, Illustrated, Illustrator, Photoshop, um, a lot, of, as a matter of fact, Lightroom, a lot of um, applications from a pen drive when I was moving things over from one computer to another. And they work perfectly yep. because it's that initial load up and then it just simply works and that's it. And since the load up is so quick anytime, anyways, because the read speeds are so insane on these USB 3 um, sticks, y you would not know that you were not using sure. uh, the application on the actual um, hard drive of the system itself. So yeah, absolutely. Really I mean, the biggest thing is getting it loaded. You know, once you load the app, it's loaded in RAM and it's running out of RAM for the most part anyway. It may need to access core files or whatever for, right. you know, functionality. But, but yeah, you're right. Now, the only caution that I would say doing something like this is most manufacturers are not designing these pen drives to be primary working devices. They're right. meant to, to store files on for transport. They're meant to store files on for backup. So, you know, do be careful with that. Flash memory does have a, you know, a limit to its number of reads and writes. Um, it's a very, sure. very high limit, um, but they, they will go bad. Things will go bad over time, even... Even the SSD internal hard drives will go bad over time, yeah. but so will a moving hard drive. So, yeah. you know, it's a limitation. That's why you've always got to have backups of everything. Yeah. I've had an SSD go bad in my in in one of the um, uh, Airs, yep. MacBook Airs, um, and they just replaced it. But yeah, it, they they usually go bad due to heat. That's, right. that's there. Right. They do not like heat. But yeah, the the little sticks, okay, they do go bad, and they do have their they do have a shelf life as as much as long as the a number of reads. Let's call it not a shelf life, but a number of reads writes. But I'll tell you one thing: they're rugged as hell too, <laughs> because I have taken um, a CF card out of a, a um, camera after a shoot and I've also taken two pen drives in the past um, left them in my pocket washed them <laughs> spun them and stuck them on high heat and dried them and, and pulled them out and they still work today the cf card as well as those yeah. two um and uh so and probably also, not a recommended method of treatment <laughs> um, of cleaning all right uh, of house cleaning yeah so it's yeah, not um, the way to clean files <laughs> yeah yeah, but it but it just goes to show like how rugged just solid state is. There's yeah. nothing there to go, you know, bad. So it's it's really it, it's an alternative. It's a good alternative, and um, obviously you're not going to be able to put terabytes onto these things. But honestly, 64 and I think it's 128 is the sweet, the sweet spot right now. You can get 128 um, a gig for reasonable. I know it's under 100 bucks, right? And 
I agree with having uh, what we're talking about having two. You have two of these redundant. They're both mirrors of each other. You take one of them. It's the size of your finger and you go stick in a safety deposit box. The thing is, is those files will be there when you go back to them in five years from now. Right. Um, which is very, very, very important. The thing that we always have to remember is um, how do we back these up? Are we doing just a mirroring backup or do we set them up to back automatically up i know we've had this debate in the past i know yep. you're more automatic i'm more manual right yeah well and we have two different workflows in that and that's really why i mean me personally i like the automatic approach but i have a system designed for that automatic and and long-term protection so right i'm using a drobo as a primary file storage I have another Drobo as a backup that's being controlled by Time Machine. Now, when right. you use Time Machine, it will do your daily backups, your incremental backups. It will do your, it'll save a weekly backup. It'll save a monthly backup and yearly backups and whatever you set it to. So I set it for automatic, but I'm doing a lot of web work. So most of my final files are living on websites and those websites right. are being backed up. So right. That that I'm pretty well covered with as far as client, you know, client files. The mm -hmm. things that, you know, I need for my own personal use are all the layered PSD files and all of the, you know, vector graphics that I've created for images or what have you. I need those internally. My client, right. for the most part, will never need nor want those files, but I need those files. So right. that's why I back up the way I do. Now, I know you with your images, that's different, right? Yeah, so um, for me, I do the backups manually. I kind of calendar it and I'll do the backup. Um, I wouldn't say as need be, but maybe let's say weekly or when there's a big project that just happened, then I'll do immediate backup once I know that everything is good. Right. Um, and when I say everything is good, um, I've had in the past times where I've had automatic backup set up and I was working on a file and it's a really important project. I make changes and the changes were wrong and I'm like, oh, let me go backwards, right? right. Let me go into the, well, in that, in so doing, come back from lunch, let's say, come back and I find that it backed up. So now the automatic back, backup has backed up the file that I don't want yeah, the any longer. Yeah, or whatever. So yeah, corrupt or it was, it was changes that I don't want. Um, now I can't go back and I have to start again or I have to fix stuff manually. So that's why for me, I don't like the automatic backup. If you're one of those people that don't back up on a regular basis, automatic is the way to go because you're going to be safer. Right. But for me, I want to know that everything is copacetic before hitting that button and saying, I want to duplicate all of these files and overwrite them onto the mirror over here. Right. I want to make sure that we're, we're, we have a strong, you know, we have, we're of a good, good files to go and overwrite the other files. If not, you're just backing up corrupt files and now you've really yeah. not helped yourself. You've hurt yourself. So That's that is right. definitely, there's just two schools of thought. Um, but whatever works for you, the main thing is, is if, like I said, Automatic is probably the best way to go because at least you know that it's happening, especially if you're, you know, complacent you don't and you don't get it done. Right. No, that's absolutely right. And you know what? We also don't want to discount cloud storage. Um, sure. Right now, you know, you could say cloud storage is expensive, but right. for the most part, it's not that expensive. If you're putting the final files up there, you know, you don't want to store everything in the cloud. You just can't. That would be very, very expensive. You can't yeah. dump all your raws up there. Um, but your final JPEGs, um, those probably should live off-site. Now, whether right. they're living off-site on a pen drive in a safe deposit box or whether you're doing automatic backups to the cloud nightly of those JPEG files. Um, right. that, you know, and again, that's what I do. I also have um, off-site cloud storage on Amazon S3. The computer runs at 3 o'clock in the morning and it uploads all changed files over to S3. So I right. know that my stuff is there. Um, you know, that's that's what I prefer. That's the way I work. Um, but regardless, cloud is still a viable option, but just not for the big, big stuff yet. As bandwidth right. increases, as internet connection speeds increase, storage prices will drop. They always drop. Um, that may become a viable option at some point in time. But today, I don't think it's quite there. 
Yeah, no, I, I agree. The, the the thing is to I'll, I'll give you a, a hint, a, a little a little way that you can do it and still back up and not have to back up those raw files off site. Um, OK, so we're making changes, let's say, in Lightroom and those Lightroom changes are being saved into a sidecar. Right. So it could be uh, XMP file, XML, whatever, whatever file um, uh, it's saving as that sidecar. That sidecar data is basically your recipe, everything that you've done to it, um, everything you've done to the files. If you save those sidecar files. OK, and then take the raws and save those separately. Those sidecar files are literally four to eight K really right. tiny, right. tiny, tiny, those recipes. Yep. So what's nice about that is, let's say you worked on a wedding and you did all of this manipulation, color manipulation, um, grading and this and that and all your crops and everything, right? If you save those XML or their XMP files in Lightroom, um, if you save those files, you will always be able to take those XMPs, overwrite your old ones, yep. let's say, and now all of that work that you did is saved. Obviously, sure. you have to save the RAWs. I would say save them locally, but in two different locations. Um, but those XMPs can be sent up into the cloud sure. and very affordably and very quickly. The problem, Trevor, is all the time is the speed, 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 speed. Right. A lot of people have down speeds that are 6, 10, 20 uh, meg. That's fine. But the problem is their up speed is a quarter of a meg, yeah. a half a meg, yeah. something very slow. Yep. So to be able to back up raw files is it's a logistic nightmare. Yes. You just can't do it. You'd be backing up a nightly for three weeks just to get but half. But that sidecar data is certainly doable because those are small Absolutely. files. So Tiny. yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I think that's a really viable option, a great way to go. Yeah. So anyways, guys, we've got a lot more for you. But before we go any further, let's go ahead and hear from one of our sponsors. Are you frustrated with slightly out of focus images when you know your autofocus spot was dead on? It's simply not your fault. From manufacturer to manufacturer, and even lens copy to lens copy, there are slight variances to the exact spot where light is being focused onto the sensor. Finally, there's a product that allows you to compensate for those variances and make sharper images immediately. Focus Pyramid, the autofocus lens calibration tool, is an absolute must for every photographer. If you want to make the sharpest images possible, then you need to take control over your camera's focusing system. With the Focus Pyramid, you can calibrate all of your lenses on your lunch break. The Focus Pyramid makes lens calibration quick and easy at an affordable price. So give your lenses a new lease on life and take your photography to the next level. Head over to focuspyramid.com forward slash DPC and get an additional 10% off just for being a show listener. Okay, we're back. And, and to kind of continue with our backup solutions and alternatives and what becomes obsolete over time and how we kind of need to migrate the data, let's say, from one format to another. I know, Joe, back in the day when, you know, we were both in the agencies and stuff, I mean, we started out using three and a half inch floppy disks for backups. <laughs> And yeah, then we moved yeah. over to those SyQuest discs. Does anybody remember those SyQuest discs? They were yeah, huge. Yeah. And the little jazz drives and um, yeah, the zip yeah. drives. I mm -hmm. mean, all these things. At the time, they were the latest and greatest cutting edge storage options that were out there. And, you know, mm -hmm. all of which were SCSI powered um, on yeah. the Mac side. So both the SCSI interface and those drives are no longer viable solutions. Right. So what did we have to do over time? We had to migrate the data from these, these you know, 100 meg zips and stuff, you know, over to the next <laughs> Little thing. side quest drives. And, yeah. 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 And, and the and next you thing didn't... was optical, you know, yeah. CDs, CDs, 700 megs. Whoa. We could put, yep. you know, seven of these zip drives datas on one tiny little CD. I mean, we, that was amazing, you know? That was amazing, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and then, of course, we had to migrate from optical because optical just was becoming not a viable solution at that point because there's just too many damn disks all over the place. So yeah. we started migrating all of that over to hard drives because yep. hard drive storage got cheap. And yeah. then we had the backup solutions a lot of what we have now, the Drobos, the large single drives, you know, mirroring drives together and things like that. So you really do have to think about the longevity of your storage solution and whether you are going to be able to migrate this data into the next best thing easily. 
Yeah, and yeah, absolutely. So that the the whole idea of this is if you create a backup and that backup is no longer accessible in five years, it doesn't really doesn't make any much of a difference it. that you did it, right? Yeah. The, yeah. the backup is useless. Yep. And um, see, this is the difference between the digital age and like, for example, for us, film days. If, you know, film days, you would, you would take your negatives, you would store them in uh, a nice light tight area that doesn't have a lot of humidity, nice and dry. And those negatives, will be around for a hundred years sure. um, if they're you know let's say processed properly um, yep. but it's just there it's just there and they can always be accessed they can always be um, used so to speak the digital age is it's just meandering all over the place so you just don't know your formats change the media changes the bus changes the way it writes changes everything changes on a regular basis and it makes it really difficult to know what do i save and how do i save it and how am i how are my photographs going to be safe in 10 years from now those sure. photographs that I took, those half a million photographs I took over the last 10 years, am I going to be able to access them? And if not, how, how do I make it so that it is so? And I can right. access them. Right. So what this means, guys, is if you do um, have been in the digital side of uh, photography for the last forever, right, ever since the very beginning, at this point, some of those first files that you have shot, um, they might be in, let's say, a format that's no longer readable, or it might be time to move them from that specific storage location to a new one that is going to be accessible. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we have to know that we're going to be doing going forward all the time. Yeah, you need to take a look. future planning. Absolutely. Definitely. You need to take a look at where your data is housed and then where you need to house it in the future yep. so that you have another five years. For example, these pen drives are USB 3. Well, we know that USB 2 has been around for like 10 years or so and it's still backwards compatible. So in 10 years from now, when let's say there's USB 4 and 5 out, chances are those USB sticks that are USB 3 will still be accessible so that the, the actual data right. you'll still be able to take off it. Now that goes into file format. Right. Right. And file format is a whole nother. <laughs> that's another. Yeah. Uh, a, another uh, different uh, horse of another color, as they say. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, in my case, like bitmap images, you know, we would use bitmap images for, um, you know, all kinds of graphics and stuff, you know, just because of uh, what they were enabled us to do. Um, but bitmap images really aren't that file format, the BMP format really aren't being used much anymore. Yeah. You know, now it's PNG. That's, you know, PNG with transparent backgrounds. I mean, that's what we're, that's what we're using now. You know, I mean, exactly. JPEG has been around for a long time. JPEG will probably continue to be around, but then you have different forms of the JPEG, you know, different compression levels. The JPEG codec has advanced over the years. And now, like right. even in Photoshop, you know, back in the earlier versions of Photoshop, you had a, the highest compression setting was 10 and right. now you have 12, right. you know, and, and you know, in the future, you're going to have 15, you yeah. know, so things change, formats change. And that's especially true with like your um, proprietary camera raw formats that right. you have to be concerned about moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, also, if you guys do video, because a lot of us are multimedia now, because we have to be. Yep. So if you're doing video, um, video is notorious for this oh, yeah. type of problem yeah. become the obsolescence factor right we'll yeah. call it um you can make a video today and in two years from now it will not even be able to be played so you make a video for a client for let's say a wedding and you give them that video chances are but in five years from now when they go and try watching it it yeah. says oh that this kodak is not available or right. we don't know how to play this or so guess what their wedding is gone their yeah. wedding is literally gone. So it, this is this could be a problem. This could be a very big problem. Now, is this your responsibility or is it not? Yeah, and that's a whole big discussion that, you know, we could really expand on. But, you know, maybe what we'll try and do for the sake of time is uh, kind of go over this quickly. But, you know, what is our responsibility to our clients to protect their digital data that we created? Now, you know, from an accounting standpoint, let's say they say, keep your, your tax records for seven years. So, you know, are we obligated to our clients to keep their images safe for seven years? 
are we obligated to keep it longer than that because it's digital, because storage is cheap, because we can? Does that mean we should or that we're obligated to? These are kind of questions that you need to ask yourself about. Um, I mean, me personally, I want to be able to keep the data for as long as I can. Right. But I'm not specifically telling my clients how long I'm going to keep it for. Um, because that really, that really is a gray area. I mean, there yeah. are catastrophic things that can happen and I could lose my files. You know, right. now what? Am I obligated to recreate every single file ever at my cost because I told the client that I would keep it for 10 years? Yeah, you have to be very careful with this, guys. Um, yeah. There would be some type of liability um, if you did in contract, contractually say, I'm going to keep it for X amount of time. Yeah. And if you don't have it for that period of time, you could be liable. Um, you want to kind of leave that out. Um, if you want to verbally kind of discuss it and say, you know, I'm going to keep it for this amount of time, then fantastic. I would not put that in the contract because we know how fleeting these files are. And honestly, in seven years, chances are you're going to have to take, at least, for example, on the video side, you'll have to migrate that video from one Kodak to another Kodak at least yep. once, maybe even twice in seven years, sure. or that will not be a viable video. And the amount of dollars that would take in the amount of hours to be able to re-export um, these weddings or these, these yeah. video, this type of, it, it just doesn't add up. You no, be, it doesn't. I mean, you're no. kind of at the point that once you, at least video wise, I would say that once you produce that final edit, that final cut and you burn it out onto a DVD or a Blu-ray or however you're delivering it to the, to the client, that's kind of it. Yeah, I, mean, you know, I think so. I mean, yeah. it's just not scalable. It's not something that you're going to be able to migrate. You know what? Save the files in their current formats. And when they're no longer accessible, if that day comes, then then so be it. But that's right. something that you don't want to tell your client that, oh, I'm going to keep your digital files um, forever. Yeah. You know, because so, unless you're going to actively be moving, migrating that stuff, um, you may not be able to access it forever. So I'll give you a little hint here. Let's just take it back to old school and um, let's do what we used to do. So let's make believe that we're shooting film and it's 12 years ago, right? We would shoot, let's say, for example, a wedding. The wedding's over. We'll go ahead and uh, proof them out, um, send them the proofs. They'll pick their stuff out, make an album for them, end of story. Those those uh, negatives go into the drawer. Um, like I said, airtight, light tight, um, nice and dry location. And then in six months from now, they say, oh, can I get a big picture of so-and-so, whatever? Yeah, absolutely, you have them. Right. What we used to do was come one year, two year down the road, we would say, okay, this client, Miss Smith, uh, her wedding was exactly two years ago. We would write to her. Um, as of this date, we are no longer going to keep your negatives. If you would like, we will sell you the negatives. Let's say it's $500. Um, it's a buyout. And from right. that point forward, you own, I write off those negatives to you. You own those negatives. You make copies. You keep them for posterity. You pass yep. them along to your family tree. <laughs> you know, yeah, whatever, whatever you want you to do. Want to do. Yep. You're, what this and that's, is doing. that's the copyright. You're signing over the copyright. You're signing over the... Right those negatives to the customer yeah right what that's doing is number number one it's giving you a way to now make one final sale yeah. on, on an image that you'll never use ever again anyways and number two it's limiting your liability and number three you're actually making the client happy because now they have that tangible in their hand because we know once something is printed in 50 60 years it's going to look like hell anyways i don't even care I, I don't care what type of archival material it's in chances are it's not going to look great so right. those those negatives would be fabulous doesn't matter if it's 10 20 50 years down the road for the most part right um but this let's look at it the same way but digitally how do we do this why don't we do the same thing two years goes down the road or a year all right mrs smith well listen we're not gonna we have we're going to be getting rid of the, your um original large uh, uh files and uh, basically just like the um, negatives would you like to buy them right if you do it's 500 dollars again let's just say and yeah. um we will now burn a dvd a blu-ray or whatever maybe give you a 128 gig pen drive Yep. Okay, we're going to hand you a pen drive with every single image on it, sign off on it, and you own all those images 
forever. Once again, hand them to your kids, relatives, whatever. That now gives you that one final sale, Yes. number one, makes them extremely happy, number two, and number three, limits your liability going forward. And you don't have to keep this any longer if you don't want. You might want right. to keep a couple of these pictures for, let's say, your book, for your album as, your, as promo pieces or whatever. Sure. But that's it. You don't need them all. You don't need them all. And you know what? This... There's, you know, two schools of thought in today's photography, you know, shoot and burn, give the client all the images, you know, they, and they make their own products from right. them, their own prints. And then you've got the other school of thought where, no, I want to maintain control over the, over the images because I want to make some extra money producing right. albums, producing prints and so on. This really is like a good hybrid method, you yeah. know, rather than giving away the farm right from day one you hang on to it you know give them some milk you know let them let them milk the cow themselves right right and then and then later on you know clear out your archives free up your liability send them everything on whatever the the media du jour is yeah. and uh and be done with it you know yeah. and then that limits your long-term liability you make that final sale but on the other hand you have the opportunity to make some additional print sales or album sales, whatever, while the iron's still hot, right. rather than giving them everything all at once. Yeah, absolutely. Good good hybrid, and I think, uh, for me, it works out great, and it could be something that worked out good for you guys also. So anyways, kind of to recap, look into these pen drives. They're really yeah. cheap. It's a viable option for storing data. Um, SSDs are still also viable, but um, they're expensive still. They're, they're yeah. just really not there. These little pen drives, but make sure you get the quick ones. If not, you're going to be plugging them in. You're going to be discouraged yeah, because they're slow. <laughs> um, yeah, we don't want to do that. Look at some yeah. of the sand disks. Um, extremes they are cheap um, and uh, it it's definitely a great way to go and finally you know keep looking out for those um, different codec changes and also file formats keep current with those formats and keep those sidecars guys upload those sidecar data up into the cloud they'll be they'll be tens of thousands of files up in the cloud, but they'll all be like 8K a piece. Yep, yep. <laughs> so you're good. Once again, that's your cooking recipe. Download those. And now you can once again have your picture exactly how you created it since from day one. That's right. You know, come up with that plan. Come up with your backup routine. Come up with your storage method, your primary um, and future plan. It's, it's really critical in today's digital age. I mean, you really need to think about the future, where you're going to be 10 years from now. Are you going to be in business 10 years from now? Right. You know, are you thinking about retiring or moving into something else? These are all things that you have to think about. So really, you know, take some time, give it some thought, come up with a plan, put that plan in place and make sure you stick with the plan. Yeah, stick to it. Absolutely. All right, Trev, we need to get out. Yes, we do. We're running real long on this show, but I think it was a lot of really good information. So, Joe, if people want to connect with you outside of the show, what's the best way for them to reach you? Yep, you can find me on Twitter, and that's at Joseph Christina, and that's Christina without an H. Great, and you can connect with me on Twitter. It's at Trevor Curry. So, all right, everyone, we are out of here for yet another week. You can get all the show notes from this episode by visiting digitalphotographycafe.com forward slash 163. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. And we will see you next week. You've been watching the Digital Photography Cafe show with Trevor Curran and Joseph Christina. Subscribe to our YouTube channel with any compatible device by visiting youtube.com forward slash dphotocafe. Be sure to subscribe to our audio feed through iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Xbox Music apps or through RSS. Visit digitalphotographycafe.com for show notes and to connect with your hosts.